All right, welcome. Uh, we're here for uh, a very important topic tonight. Uh, Prince William County started with volunteers. I believe in the late 1800s, but I know that OWL started in 1938. I'm not sure about Dale City. 50 years ago. 50 years ago. So we're 80 years and 50 years. That's where it all started. And if you remember, um, the uh, fire levees way back were depending on where you lived in the county. They might be a little different depending on where you lived. And so currently, we have eight volunteer fire departments, about 15 stations, and over 500 volunteers uh, serving as firefighters and EMS personnel in our county. Isn't that fantastic? Mm -hmm. Yes, you can <coughs> And over the years, um, our Department of Fire and Rescue evolved. I believe in the 1960s is when that all started. And now we have over 600 career firefighters and EMS serving all across the county. They serve at six, at all the stations really, but there are six career stations. But they also serve at all 21 stations. So let's give them a round of applause. Public safety, we know, I know as a supervisor that public safety is so important. Sometimes we have debates and arguments on what's more important, you know, to our county. Is it education? Is it transportation? Is it, is it our incentives for economic development? Or is it public safety? And depending on what research article you read, uh, you could probably come up with any, of, any one of those three. But, uh, I just want to read you a sentence from an article that was written in uh, 2015. And this article is all about what is best in terms of government spending. What's, what makes economic development thrive when we spend on government services? How should we be taxing? How should we be spending our money? And this uh, research article came to the conclusion, and you're going to love this. <laughs> on the spending side of the equation, only government expenditures on public safety have a consistent positive association with economic growth in most studies. So I was pretty, I was pretty impressed with that. It's a very complex article out of uh, North Carolina. and. Uh, you know, what, where would we be without public safety? It would be very, very difficult uh, to incentivize economic growth in our county without public safety. It would be very difficult to have a county uh, where families wanted to come and live without public safety. So we definitely appreciate all of those uh, in the room that serve uh, currently in our county. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your service. It's very important to the Board of Supervisors, public safety, and especially uh, tonight we're talking about firefighters and EMS. In fact, we have some important goals in our county in terms of, of uh, fire response and EMS response. The level of service uh, that we're trying to get to is that ALS could respond anywhere in the county within eight minutes. And we're up over 80% on that goal being able to get anywhere in the county within eight minutes for advanced life support. For basic life support, we try to get there in four minutes. And I think we're somewhere over 50% on, on that level of service goal. The one we're, we're kind of lacking is fire response. And we're only in the 40s actually, getting uh, fire suppression to a location within four minutes, and that's our goal. So we're somewhere in the 40s on that. So we have a ways to go. We have a, a, a great fire service in our county, but we have a ways to go in terms of reaching our goals. So thank you for coming and uh, listening uh, to this tonight. We have four experts with us tonight. We have two representing our Department of Fire and Rescue in the county, the career uh, personnel. 
and then we have two representing our volunteer fire departments. So we are going to hear presentations from them, and while they're talking, I'm sure you're going to be thinking about questions that you want to ask. So I'll ask you to think about think about that now, because those of you who are members will get the first opportunity to ask questions. I think I'm going to get the first opportunity to ask my question uh, when they're done with their presentations. But first, I'm going to uh, introduce our speakers. The theme tonight is, what is the future? What is the future of our combined fire and rescue service? Because it is combined. It's different than some other jurisdictions. Uh, in some places in our nation, we have all volunteers still. In some places, we have all career. Ours is combined. And our mission and our goal on the Board of Supervisors is to have this combined service thrive and working toward those goals uh, that I just mentioned. So we're going to uh, start with um, Mr. Lance uh, McClintock. I'll, I'll introduce them uh, one at a time. He is our Assistant Chief of Operations in the Department of Fire and Rescue. He has served over 23 years. He's got 23 years of experience in this career of fire and EMS service. He is an assistant chief with the Prince William County Department of Fire and Rescue, composed of over 660 career uniform personnel. Assistant Chief McClintock currently oversees the operations section of the Department of Fire and Rescue. And I'm gonna let him finish uh, telling you about himself as he presents. Uh, about our theme tonight. Assistant Chief McClintock. Can everyone hear me? No, sir, please use it. Use it? Okay, yes. no problem. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lance McClintock. As uh, Supervisor Anderson said, I'm the uh, Assistant Chief of Operations for the Department of Fire and Rescue. Uh, working towards my 24th year with the department, I'm here representing uh, the department and uh, Chief McGee, who unfortunately couldn't be here this evening due to a prior commitment. Um, but one of the things that I've learned through my career and some of the uh, professional classes that I've taken and through my mentors, as a chief in an organization or the chief in an organization, you never pass up an opportunity to speak with the community about um, your department um, and engage with the community that we serve. So thank you for uh, allowing us to be here this evening. We've got a lot of great folks here on the panel. Uh, looking forward to hearing from, from all of them. Um, this is a great um, uh, actual picture of how our system works on a daily basis um, from a combined system and the way that we provide service to you, the citizens of the county. Um, I'm going to try to keep things fairly simple uh, this evening, but if you have some questions, just I'm sure there'll be some time towards the end to be able to answer those. Um, and I'm not going to try to get too far down into the weeds here and make sure I'm pressing the right button. Yeah, oh, there we go. Um, the Department of Fire and Rescue, just very quickly, um, our mission, vision, and values are posted up there. It's very simple. Um, from a mission standpoint, our goal is to protect lives, property, and the environment through timely, professional, humanitarian services essential to the health, safety, and well-being of the community. Bottom line is we're in the uh, service business and we're here to provide a service to you. So when you call or the citizens call, our, it's our duty as a combined fire and rescue system um, to provide that service to you. And our vision, our values are up there as well. Um, as Supervisor Anderson said, we are a fire and rescue system, a combined system of career personnel along with um, our volunteer um, counterparts um, in our various volunteer agencies, which we'll talk about here in a second. I'll get this in a second. Uh, the Fire and Rescue System in Prince William County, uh, the Department of Fire and Rescue, which I represent, is a metropolitan-sized fire and rescue department consisting of, six, as of today, 661 uniformed uh, personnel, and we also have 63 non-uniformed personnel that serve throughout the department in uh, various capacities to support what we do on a daily basis. Uh, our volunteer departments, there's eight companies approximately 568 operational members and approximately 994 volunteer uh, personnel in total. Uh, I bring that up as an important fact because um, not every, while not everyone is operational, everybody plays an important role. 
ran a call, um, an incident um, on the west end of the county here just last Thursday off the Livingston Drive. It was an outside fire. It's a great example how have we worked together as a combined system, career and volunteer on this incident to mitigate that event to include non-operational members. Uh, this was a prolonged event where fire and rescue units that were there. I think it was probably from about 7 o'clock until 2 or 3 in the morning, if I remember correctly. And uh, we had a non-operational member uh, bring the canteen unit, um, which basically consists of food and beverage for our folks um, since they're on a prolonged event. Great example of how we work collectively to uh, mitigate incidents here in the county. Uh, I'll spend a little bit of time on this um, as, as I progress, but the fire and rescue governance, um, and I'll get into this a little bit, um, we operate under uh, the county code for fire protection, which is currently chapter 9.2. That's not going to mean a lot to you here, but I'll talk to that um, briefly here in a few minutes. And obviously there's state, um, federal, and um, other industry standards that we're required to follow um, being in the fire and rescue system. I'm not going to spend a tremendous amount of time on this, but obviously there are certain standards that we need to meet um, as professional um, organizations providing service to the community. Uh, guiding documents here locally, as Supervisor Anderson talked about, um, we have a Prince William County comprehensive plan, and we have a strategic plan, and then um, the other guiding documents are, are near-miss, post-incident analysis, and line of duty death report. So we learn from the incidents that we run, try to improve the service that we deliver um, on a continuous basis. Um, the, strategic, the current strategic plan for the county, and I think Supervisor Anderson alluded to this, um, for 2017-2020, um, we want to provide safe communities. And um, what we want to do is we want to increase percentage of fire responses within, 41, or within four minutes from the 41%, which she talked about. We're currently striving to be able to do that and fill those service gaps to uh, continuously increase that number. Um, from the strategic plan, increase percentage of basic life support, or BLS, uh, response within four minutes from the 50%. We're actually slightly above that now in the mid-50s. An increased percentage of advanced life support ALS response within eight minutes from 83%. I think we're right around 85% um, percent, um, for this for, for last fiscal year. And one of the things we'll talk about, or one of the themes for me in, in, in you know, tonight's presentation is about the future outlook. It's about making sure that this combination system can meet the needs of a growing organization. And that ties directly to the comprehensive plan and the workload capacity. Um, which is based on number of fire and rescue incidents of a, that a tactical unit is able to respond to. And that number um, right now is 2,000. And I can tell you right now, we have units within the county, um, and it's right down the street here at Station 11 Stonewall, which is above that capacity. And we need to work as a system collectively to work, um, figure out how to um, reduce that number so we can make sure we're responding to incidents in a timely manner. One way that we're doing that for Station 11 here at Stonewall is we have Station 22 that um, has been approved by the Board of County Supervisors. Construction for that um, station is, is underway. It's in the planning process. That station here is in the Groveton area off of Balls Ford Road, which is currently in part in Station 11's first two. When that station is open, it'll um, hopefully work towards a response of reducing um, that workload capacity for that station. Fairly simple, but challenging to accomplish. Uh, regionalization, uh, I, I only put this slide in here to let everybody know that the Department of Fire and Rescue and the services that we provide here, we don't work independently um, in total from the uh, region, that we work collaboratively um, with the, the National Capital Region, we work collaboratively with the Northern Virginia Region, we run mutual aid calls with Fairfax, Loudoun, Fauquier, um, we have a lot of the same policies and procedures as far as operational response. Um, we just don't operate in this silo of Prince William County. Uh, we do um, have a consolidated fire and EMS dispatch with the cities of Manassas and Manassas Park. So we do work collaboratively in the services that we provide. Um, and as I mentioned, mutual aid response. Um, I'm sure that uh, the, the, the panel will um, touch on this. The fire and rescue system reform uh, that we recently went through. Um, and when I say talk about fire and rescue system reform, that's reform of the combination system and, and the services that we provide here and basically the change in county code, um, and I talked about this previously of chapter 9.2 of the county code. That process began in January of 2016 with a directive from the Board of County Supervisors to the county executive. Uh, it was about an 18 month process, Chief. 
Uh, it was a county executive or CXO led process that engaged all stakeholders. Uh, and a draft was created by the CXO's steering team and the members of that team are listed here. Uh, it was Chief Jerry Dean with the Yorkshire Volunteer Fire Department. Chief Chris Wool with Dale City Volunteer Fire Department. Uh, Chief Jim McAllister, who's here this evening from the OWL uh, Volunteer Fire Department. Uh, Chief Kevin McGee for the Department of Fire and Rescue. Deputy Chief Keen, Tim Keen from Department of Fire and Rescue and Assistant Chief uh, Jim Forio. Uh, through that process, uh, they were able to draft um, what would become Chapter 9.2 of the County Code. Uh, there was consensus received at the uh, previous Fire and Rescue Association and then that new county code passed by the Board of County Super Supervisors about nine months ago um, in August of 2017. So we're working under the new county code um, as we stand here this evening. What does that mean? Um, I tried to distill that down to basically four bullet points. That's actually a 30-page document and I've turned it into one slot. Um, the purpose is, and this is an actual quote from that 30-page document, purpose, collaborative system for the provision of fire, rescue, and emergency medical services. The key word there being collaborative. The system chief is the individual who has the responsibility of overseeing and leading the Prince William County Fire and Rescue System. That individual is Chief Kevin McGee. The executive committee is the body created to provide input to the system chief. Uh, the executive committee is currently made up of seven individuals. That's three individuals um, uh, voted upon by our volunteer departments, correct, Chief? Um, currently, that consists of Chief McAllister from OWL, Chief Jerry Deem from Yorkshire, and Chief Tom Wood from Stonewall here at Station 11. And then there's three Department of Fire and Rescue members there. Uh, Deputy Chief Tim Keene, Assistant Chief Matt Smolsky, and Assistant Chief Jim Forgo. The seventh member is our Operational Medical Director. So that, that is the um, Executive Committee for the Fire and Rescue System. And this fourth bullet here I put is, this is an ongoing transition. Um, we're nine months into this. We're still figuring it out. Um, I think that there's some lessons that we've learned. There's some things that we um, certainly need to uh, look at and focus on as we move forward, but I can sit here and tell you the focus of this evening, the, focus, the future is bright for Prince William County Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, I know I'm almost running out of my 12 minutes. I thought I was only gonna take about five, but apparently um, I think you said I would probably go longer than I thought I would. Future outlook, um, and, and I'll try to be brief here. Um, this future outlook is exactly what's in the um, FY18 budget, or FY19, I'm sorry, budget. Uh, document and those are service, service achievement goals. Basically, that's where are the gaps in the system and what do we need to do to fill those gaps in service from response times. Effective firefighting force and resource requirements. We need to make sure that we have the correct number of units and the correct number of support personnel to mitigate the incidents that we respond to, which are becoming actually more complicated for a variety of different reasons to include building construction and just the environment that we operate in. Uh, the comprehensive plan standard specifically related to construction of new fire and rescue stations. That plan identifies that there are seven new fire and rescue stations um, that need to be com completed and built within the county. It's about one every other year. Um, and like I said, there's one of those that's already in the planning phase on the west end of the county and one that's already been approved um, for the east end of the county as well. Public Safety Training Academy expansion critically important to a combination system. Uh, we need to make sure that we're keeping um, what our needs are from a training perspective to ensure that our folks, both career and volunteer, are trained. Recently required, I think it was 128 additional acres adjacent to our current um, training center location out in Oaksville, which will be very beneficial for that expansion from everything from new classrooms, burn building, and something as simple as parking for the number of people that are trained there on a daily basis. And then obviously the healthcare evolution. Um, the, the healthcare industry, and we are essentially a healthcare organization, as someone once told me, with everything that's going on um, in the healthcare revolution and what we do to even address the opioid crisis here in Prince William County, um, to working with our um, uh, public safety partners in response to active violence or active shooter events are things that we need to work on from a future outlook perspective. So, the future is good, and I'll turn it over to uh, back to Ms. Anderson as the moderator. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Assistant Chief McClintock. You know, one thing that 
that I am really happy about is that Prince William County is an exciting county. It's a growing county. Uh, there are areas even in the Commonwealth of Virginia that are doing things like merging schools. And, you know, they don't have the business. They don't have the economy that we have right here. And we just heard about all the new fire stations that we need, and we know we need new schools. So sometimes we can groan and, oh, we don't want any more development. But I, I would much rather be in a county that's growing and fixing and building than in one that's having to figure out which schools to merge. So uh, thank you for your presentation. You. Next is Chief Jim McAllister. He has been a volunteer firefighter for over 30 years, 27 years with OWL. So I'm going to do a trivia question. What does O stand for? Uh, <laughs> w. L. Lord. Lord. All right, you passed. <laughs> that was the first test for, <laughs> for OWL. And he has recently retired uh, from the Federal Aviation Administration, served for 31 years in that role. So uh, he has um, added much, you know, to to the volunteer firefighters with with that other uh, job that he had. Just just think of all that he brings uh, with that knowledge in terms of public safety. So we welcome you, Chief Jim McAllister. And in some cases, I'm ready to go back to work. It keeps me too busy. <laughs> Hopefully I can manage this. So good evening. Again, my name is Jim McAllister. Um, I've been around for a while, been here for 27 years. I was fortunate enough to come up under a couple of former chiefs at OWL. Um, and sometimes you're mentored and you don't even realize you're being mentored. Sometimes you're just drugging into meetings and said, hey, why don't you come to this meeting with me? Be careful. <laughs> you end up sitting up here someday. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of how it happened. Uh, ended up uh, becoming a chief and through a roundabout long story, but I'll leave that alone. So we're going to talk about the uh, the fire and rescue system in Prince William County and, and go through some things uh, that we have going on. But first and foremost, what I want to talk about, I think, I, I, well, let me let me back up and address one thing that Chief McClintock was talking about. I never want to scare anybody. And when we start talking about we're only meeting goals 50% of the time, 51% of the time, or 40 some percent of the time, we're trying to put a fire truck or an ambulance on a scene in four minutes. Find a fire station between Milksville and 234 Station 6 on Cole, uh, Coles District. So you got about a 12, 14 minute response between those two stations. So until you put a station back there, you're always, that number's always going to look low. And it's that way in the county. We, can't, we don't have the means to put a fire station everywhere to get that four minute response yet. So you have to look at what do we have going on, where, where the number, and, and I hate to say this out loud because it sounds bad, but where are, your, where are all your calls? And, and Chief McClintock talked about that. We look at the call volume. Well, where does that next station need to go? Eventually, we need seven more stations or eight more stations, and we need to cover all those areas. But you start building those stations as the money permits, as the time permits, as the staffing permits, and so forth. So don't think that we're not trying to get to that 100%. But until we get stations in some of those rural areas of the county, that number is still going to hold low. So try not to try not to judge us on that number. We get it to 70 percent. That's a pretty good jump. Um, anyway, I point it over here and hit the button. It's the bottom button. There we go. So what I want to talk about are who are our volunteers, real quick. Um, I want to. I think there's a. When I'm out and I'm talking and people start asking me, well, who are the volunteers? Well, I can speak for who the volunteers are at OWL. I would never try to speak for Dale City. You're going to hear from them. Um, I know most of their volunteers. I know a lot of the volunteers around the county because of the different committees that I sit on, getting around to the different firehouses, watching the training, and so forth. So I want to talk just for a couple minutes about who our volunteers are that, and what we bring to the table is the volunteer side of the contingent. So we can put words up here and we can put a montage and create a montage of all these different things. <laughs> Who are our volunteers? They're our moms, our dads, 
there are people that are sitting in the houses in Prince Anne County. In some cases, they're not even in Prince Anne County. They live in other nearby jurisdictions. They live in Fairfax. But they're not allowed the same opportunities or provided the same opportunities. So they come down here to volunteer their time because they want to ride on a fire truck. They want to ride on an ambulance. They want to provide a service, but they're not allowed to do it in their jurisdictions for for reasons that they don't have a true combination system like we have here in Prince William County. So while they can provide services in their counties, sometimes those services are a little bit different. Okay. Um, members, I just got this stat. I was at a Chiefs conference in Phoenix uh, a week and a half ago, and they they've been looking at our department for the last three years um, as part of a grant that we've been going through. 26% of my current operational membership, and I have 147 operational people, that's 147 in OWL that can jump on a fire truck, an ambulance, go down the street, provide a service. 26% of them are career firefighters in the metro area somewhere. Whether it's Fairfax County, Alexandria, Arlington, uh, DC, Stafford, Spotsylvania, Loudoun, somewhere here in the area, um, Fauquier County, we, that's what we have. So they bring a lot to the table. Why do they, you, you think about that, do you want to go do your job? And then do you want to go do that same job for free at night? Most people are like, no, there's no reason I would do that. <laughs> These guys have a love for it. It's in their blood, it's in their passion. They want to be providing a service. They come back, they know what their communities have, they provide that service in their community. In some cases, in many cases, these people started with us. They became junior firefighters, 16, somewhere under the age of 18, between the ages of 16 and 18 years old, they became junior firefighters with our department. They have gone through the system, they've become career, they've taken the tests, found their, their way through career paths, and they still recognize where they came from. They recognize where they got the opportunity from, and they still come back and provide a service. So, what do we do for them? A lot of the neighboring jurisdictions, believe it or not, even though they have higher tax bases than we do, don't have the tax money, don't have the funding to provide their career firefighters with the same opportunities that we can provide in this county and that we provide our volunteers. So we can provide training for them. We can send them out to training classes, which is career progression in their departments. Another reason we're looking at, we're bringing them here and keeping them here. From OWL, I've got people that are wearing white shirts, meaning they're officers that started with us as junior members that are captains and battalion chiefs, lieutenants in the metro area. I've got captains and battalion chiefs in Alexandria. I've got a battalion chief and several uh, firefighters um, and I believe one sergeant, one lieutenant in the District of Columbia. And then um, we've even got some of our members that have gone out. I've got people that started with us that are in Colorado that are on wildland firefighting. Um, wow. And we've got other people that are in uh, FDMY. Um, if you remember back uh, a couple of years ago, you saw the big church fire in, in D.C. And, or in uh, um, New York City. The guy right there that was pumping that had the fire truck, that was one of our members. Wow. Matter of fact, that took him in his first fire. Mentored him. Got him. He got a job in New York, went to New York. We miss him, but that's where he is. So anyway, what I want to show you up here is we're made up of a lot of things. Um, probably can't see it somewhere in there. It says engineers. So I have a couple of engineers in the department, yeah. structural engineers. Why would you think that would come in handy? We have a collapse rescue team. What, where can I get better knowledge than to have a structural engineer? This guy is, these guys are working for a living as structural engineers, right. doing this day in and day out. Then they're coming and they're riding on fire trucks and they're helping us develop a collapse rescue team. So here's some things that we started at OWL. Um, we are the oldest fire department in Prince William County. The only one older is the city of Manassas, but they're not Prince William County, they're the city. So we, we like to say we're the oldest in the county. Um, so we started the first collapse rescue company in Prince William County uh, back in the uh, um, early 90s. It was the late 80s, early 90s, and we started with a bread truck. And that's what we had. And I'm sure Clancy can probably even remember that. Um, but he was our, he was one of our guys. So we had a uh, we had a bread truck that was way overweight and was kind of unsafe. But anyway, we uh, we went to the we went to the fire board at the time and said, hey, we want to start this. They looked at us and said, no, we're not giving you money for that. We were denied the fire the the funding from the levy. 
we built and purchased it with fundraising money. Um, and now there are two collapse rescue teams in Prince William County. There's one east and one west. The second one is out here in Gainesville, and we meet in the middle. And we dispatch them both on every call, and we use lumber off each other's vehicles, we use the expertise and so forth off the vehicles. Next thing that we looked at is we had a fire boat. The fire boat was a small boat, had a little pump on it, didn't go very fast, didn't do much, but it worked. Guys had a dream, they wanted to build something, and we recognized that we had a need for something larger with the Potomac River and so forth, so we went on a mission, and we finally got this company out of Kingston, Ontario, to build this. They were building for the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Coast Guard, and this boat was born. That is hole number one. You can look around the D.C. metro area, you can find Alexandria with a 50-foot version of this. Uh, Fairfax has the same boat, a 36-footer, PG County, and there's uh, Annapolis, there's a lot of them. They build them around the world. They scale them down to 30 feet and up to 74. Again, we were denied funding for it. We applied. One of our uh, congressmen got us a local grant, a federal grant, so it worked out well. Recognize the need for to move air. There's a lot of studies on what's the best way to move air around a building. How do we get the smoke out of a building the best way? So recognizing this, we worked with Dale City on this. We purchased a truck, Dale City purchased a fan, and currently in the, well, at the time we did this in the world, they would put these on uh, trailers and they would tow them. We said, well, why not put it on a truck? So our mechanics came in on their off time and they built this. They assembled it and put it on a truck. It's on a cog dispatch. It goes to DC. It's got winches and everything. It can go into the metro tunnels. It gets called out. It goes to all kinds of different stuff around, around the region. Again, denied funding, fundraising money. Volunteers raised money. We bought it, put it together, and now it's used by everybody. Everything I'm showing you is used by everybody. I'd be remiss if I didn't stand up here and talk about the Department of Fire and Rescue for a few minutes. So I picked this picture just uh, quickly to throw up here because it, um, it uh, shows a training scenario that we just did over the weekend, and it shows exactly what happens in the field. Well, we may have our difference in opinion sometimes at the top, and while we're sitting there and we're trying to work through some of the harder, uh, harder discussions in the field, this is what it looks like. You can see the coats, the helmets. There's a little bit difference maybe in what people are wearing, but they're working together, they're training together. They did uh, about four and a half hours of training last Saturday in 92 degrees heat. Okay, then they all sat down and had a meal together. That's what happens in the field. We all work together. We're one system, we work together, we act like that. So where does our future need to go? And I know I'm behind time here, so I'll try to run through here quick. Um, but what is our future? Well, we need three things. We need three things to get started and to move uh, fruitfully forward, and that would be leadership, vision, and collaboration. So you heard uh, Chief McClintock talk about that. It's in Chapter 9.2 with the collaboration. I have that in a slide coming up. Leadership is important. If we don't have leadership that's going to lead and that can provide the necessities of leadership to the organization, we're not going anywhere. We've got to have effective leadership. So I'm going to talk about those real quick. Again, I threw the montage of words up here. We can look, I'm sure you can Google it, you can probably come up with about 2.6 million different things that people would say are effective leadership. What does it mean to you? What does it mean to us? Well, it's what we need in our system. How, how do we look at leadership? How do we get others to respond? And how do we get people to follow? With that particular leader. Okay, so there's a lot of different things: trust, loyalty, vision, perspectives, um, communications. A lot of different things we can look at. But here's the six things that it boils down to: we've got to look for a leader that has these these traits. Okay, under the principles, they've got to have trust. They've got to be respected. They've got to provide respect, and they've got to have the right attitude. Under the abilities. They have to have the ability to communicate with the, uh, with the entire system. They've got to have a focus, and they've got to have a vision. And if we don't have a vision, we're not going anywhere. I like to use the five levels of leadership by John C. Maxwell. I hand it out to my officers, say, read this, try to get an idea of it. I'm going to skip through this real quick. The real thing is position. We're all given a position. I was given a position of leadership when I was put in as a uh, lieutenant in the fire station. When I was elected as the chief of the department, I was given a position of, of uh, leadership. I'm at the number one. Number two, you have to earn that. That's where people give you the permission to lead. If you don't get that, you're not going to be successful. People have got to give you that permission. Okay? We've got to start moving through, and it just continues to build off of that. 
we've got to have a vision. That vision, you heard Chief McClintock talk about it. It's spelled out in our documents. Chapter 9.2 is for accommodation fire and rescue system, effective leadership. We've got to have a collaborative environment. We've got to be proactive, not reactive. And then we've got to uh, communicate effectively. And I think I got, can I do the last two slides? <laughs> Um, the last slide here I can actually skip through really quick. Fire and rescue system, I really want to do cover the top of this because this is what we need. What do we need to move forward successfully? We need those three bullets on the top. The fire and rescue system, we need the Department of Fire and Rescue to sit at the table. We need the volunteer leadership to sit at the table. And we need the local, the union, local 2598 to sit at the table. <coughs> we need the three of us to sit together to collaborate effectively in order to lead this, this system effectively into the future. The other statement is just what Chief McClintock read out of Chapter 9.2, and that's our immediate needs. I just talked about it, leadership, vision, collaboration, recruitment and retention we haven't really touched on. That's a big topic right now. We need that not only for career, we need it for volunteer also, and we need to work on our infrastructure so we can get those times up, I should say, get our response times so that they're 80, 90 percent, and that's what we need to do. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Chief McAllister. Uh, we have a lot to be proud of. You heard you heard a lot there about um, you know those that are volunteering uh, in our volunteer fire departments. What you also have heard a little bit about in in that presentation is probably the reason that we're here tonight. <coughs> If, if everything was absolutely rosy, we might not be having uh, this event tonight. But there's, there's been some tension, you know, between uh, perceived tension in some cases between uh, career and volunteers. You've read about it in some blogs, you've read about it in some media, uh, you've probably had some discussions uh, with friends, especially if um, if you're in an area perhaps where where there are volunteer um, fire departments so that is probably where some of your questions are going to come from I will tell you that as a board of supervisors we want both to thrive and we want them to thrive together for the good of our mission for the good of our people and um, and so that's that's why I agreed to be here tonight because I definitely want both both our career and our volunteers to thrive and and that there won't be this tension in terms of uh, working on the mission with that I'm going to introduce captain uh, Paul Hebert who's all ready to go here uh, newly promoted captain and he has served in the Department of Fire and Rescue for 28 years I believe and uh, he currently is at Buckhall Volunteer, um, at the Buckhall Volunteer Fire Station, but he is career uh, DFR. So, but you have also served at several other stations in Prince William County. He's also the president of Prince William Professional Local 2598, and he does a good job advocating. I will tell you that. He's been in my office many times. Uh, he speaks before the uh, Board of Supervisors. He's very articulate, he's got his facts together, and uh, he does a good job advocating, so welcome. Thank you, that's, uh, I'm done. <laughs> appreciate that. That's a good uh, appreciate the invitation this evening, Supervisor Anderson. My, uh, my other claim to fame is uh, I actually taught Lance McClintock how to drive a fire truck. Uh, when he came out of recruit school to, uh, to Station 8 in Yorkshire, I was his mentor and kind of showing him the ropes and you know, look at him now, assistant chief, so he's <laughs> making me proud. Thank you. Um, the beauty of going third, uh, a lot of the information has already been shared this evening, so I'm going to kind of give it from my perspective or our, our perspective. I did not create a PowerPoint presentation because I'm not real good with those anyway, so unfortunately you have to really, yeah, well, just look at me. And I know I've been told I've got a great face for radio, so we'll just have to go with that. So as Supervisor Anderson said, um, I'm the president of Prince William Professional Firefighters Local 2598, representing the, uh, the career firefighters in the county. 
And she is correct that we do a lot of meetings with supervisors and we do a lot of stuff at the, the board meetings to try to advocate for improvements uh, for the lives and livelihood of, of our members. So the, the topic tonight, and I appreciate uh, Chief McAllister ending with recruitment and retention because that's kind of a biggie for us right now. There was a um, um, recruitment and retention study done this past year by an outside consultant. And um, we have an issue with uh, competitiveness with Fairfax County Fire and Rescue uh, to where we were starting to fall behind as far as salaries go, as well as uh, a work week issue for us. And so they made some recommendations to, uh, to change and, and fix some of the salary compression issues, which the uh, supervisors have voted to do this budget year. And then there's a proposal to change uh, our work week in the next fiscal year which would eliminate uh, a, a major detractor for us, which is our, our operations daytime work week schedule. So <clears throat> that's what we are looking for. And you, the, the topic tonight is the future of fire and rescue. What's it gonna look like? So our, our goal and our, our hope is that in July of, of 2019, that we no longer have a, uh, a work week that is causing people to leave and go to work in other jurisdictions. Uh, we're hoping that we can put that work week together and working in concert with the volunteers. Um, there are several di different ways to do the work schedule uh, throughout the county. There are different setups at different stations that currently do that type of model. And there are some stations that don't currently do that model that we can certainly work something out to make that happen. Uh, but it is the, the main goal is to try to eliminate the uh, career staff who, let's face it, we spend a lot of money in training, hiring, training, and especially if they become paramedics, you're talking two hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars after two years. For that individual to take that investment and leave and go to work for Fairfax County, that that's an investment lost here in Prince William. So if we can uh, if we can be successful in getting that work week changed to where the folks won't want to leave here, they'll stay here to work here. That's that's savings money and, and improving the service. It's, you know, uh, improving service for the citizens and visitors of Prince William County. So I think I've uh, made up for some of the uh, time on the couple of first presenters, um, but that, that's where, like I said, they've covered a lot of the stuff uh, for, from our standpoint, from the employee standpoint, that's the, that's the main focus over the next year is elimination of the daytime schedule. Thank you. of expertise here tonight um, I meant it these people uh, our panelists tonight have decades of experience in firefighting EMS work and uh, mr. Uh, Steve Chapel here assistant chief at uh, Dale City Volunteer Fire Department uh, assistant chief for human resources he also leads uh, one of five battalions of the four Dale City uh, stations so again a lot of expertise and uh, for many years it was Dale City that would arrive uh, where we live uh, down Baker Race and um, our neighbors are even older than Rich and I are so let me just say that quite a few calls are placed from our neighborhood <laughs> so uh, we appreciate uh, the service from Dale City uh, Volunteer Fire Department so Steve if, and you know what? He was in the Army Reserves, yes. in the infantry. Oh. 1994, I saw on his resume, yeah, yeah. he was voted the, the top reserve officer, and right? Infantry. Yeah. So yeah. thank you very Army much uh, for that service. <laughs> All right. They're the best. Please. Thank you very much. So I'm pulling up the rear of this. <laughs> These three gentlemen done an excellent job of briefing the champagne dreams of the fire rescue service. <coughs> and as a taxpayer, not on the payroll of the county government, let me throw a wet blanket on all the great things they've told you. Because 
you would think after 45 minutes, this is like the greatest thing since sliced bread. You know, where's the future fire and rescue? <clears throat> Here's the background. The Dell City Volunteer Fire Department has four of the 21 stations in the county. 1,750 runs per month. That's, uh, you know, about 30 or 40 percent of the call volume. If we were our own city inside the county, we'd be the 13th largest city providing services to 100,000 citizens. It's a monumental feat. We have a great time doing it. We're doing about 15,000 man hours a month of service to the county at, uh, at no reimbursement. Our operating budget is a mere $3.2 million. That's to keep the apparatus going, lights on the water, maintain the buildings. It's incredibly inexpensive for the taxpayer. <clears throat> You'll notice that we staff our apparatus from 6 at night till 6 in the morning, every weekend, every holiday. As Captain Hebert uh, referred to, the county's trying to get rid of the daylight career staff schedule, the 48-hour <coughs> employee. Right now, the career staff's on a 48-hour work week. If you're on day shift at a Dale City firehouse, you work from 6 in the morning to 6 at night. If you're at um, Nexville Station 25, they have 48-hour employees too, but they're 24-hour shifts. They work two 24-hour shifts a week. So when you compare the 48-hour career day employee to the 48-hour shift employee, the 48-hour daylight employee, no weekends, no holidays, no nights, at home with their family. But they don't get paid as much because they don't work holidays and weekends. And in the recruitment and retention study, those employees, about 10% of the workforce, complained that they would leave and go to shift work if they didn't eliminate it. So, July 1st of 2019, there's an attempt to eliminate the day shift employee, put them all in shift work. What are the volunteers going to do? Career staff will be there. I'll get to that. The other, uh, the other complaint was Fairfax County is a better fire and rescue service in Prince William County. That's what the employees are telling the surveyors. I teach at the Fairfax County. Fire and Rescue Cat. You know how many employees left Prince William County <clears throat> and went to Fairfax last year? Eight. What's the head count? 660. So you got eight employees and 10% of the workforce driving what is about to become a very expensive proposition for the taxpayers of Prince William County. <clears throat> to replace the volunteers with career staff on every rig at every fire station. Of the 1,750 calls a month that originate from the Dale City Fire Station, 61% are EMS, sicknesses, illnesses, auto accidents, overdoses, unconscious people, stoppages of breathing. 484 fall under other. Somebody's alarm went off. Water pipe broke in the street and there's flooding. Not emergency types of stuff. And then a mere 223 is that something caught on fire. Bulch, a car, <coughs> brush, um, wires, or a house, an apartment, townhouse, or a commercial structure. This data is for the month of January. Of the 223 
fire response isn't originated from Dale City Fire Station. There were two actual fires. The rest of the other responses, it was general concern of the person who reported it, something's actually on fire. But 1,066 sick and injured and unconscious patients. From 2016 to 2017, the EMS call volume in Dale City increased 10%. The fire suppression call volume dropped by 20%. So the trend over time has been EMS calls are increasing, fire calls are decreasing. Fire crews at Dale City, when you look at the work day, their response and their non-response time, only 10% of the fire crews are actually responding on calls. 40% of the time the EMS crews are tied up with the sick and injured, and the data supports that. Dell City Volunteer Fire Park's got 200 members. One sitting in the crowd back over here. We take our 200 members, we divide them up into five shifts. We got one shift on, four shifts off. Our ability to respond to major events with our off-duty crews is pretty quick. 70% of our membership lives in Prince William County. 40% of the DFR staff is in Prince William County. When we have large events, it's going to be tough to recall career people because they've got a long way to travel to get up here and take care of major events. Our population is diverse. Our department's diverse. It's well-educated. We have a physician. We have attorneys. We have business owners. Masters prepared people. College, etc as volunteers in the community. Senators. <laughs> you got to stay sent. <laughs> and every year the county does a satisfaction survey, the Fire and Rescue Service, independent uh, division of the University of Virginia. 97% of the citizens are satisfied with Fire and Rescue Service in the county. <clears throat> Another fallacy, volunteerism is dead. I don't know where this is, but it's basically touted by the people who don't actually market and recruit and train volunteers. In the last 120 days, our membership's actually grown by 10%. The number of applicants that are in the process to have their backgrounds checked, the FBI fingerprinting process, the Inova Employee Health Physical, 64 additional volunteers. Some of the certifications already. We've got 124 people who have hit our internet site, expressed interest in volunteering, just haven't made it an interview yet. The so volunteerism in Prince William County is not dead. Only if I can tell you, we got to replace the volunteers because you can't do the job because they don't have the numbers. They got the numbers. You got to work with it. The cost to recruit a volunteer in this county is about $200. Anybody here work in government? You ever have to recruit somebody into government? I don't know what it costs to recruit a career firefighter in this county, <clears throat> but the Fairfax County is about 80 grand. To get one person from the day they put ink on an application to the time they're sitting in recruit school because they have such a large group to process to funnel it down to 35. When they open up the process in Fairfax County, 1,500 people apply for a job, 35 get it, the job. It takes a lot of money to funnel it down to that 35. Our turnover rate is a mere 8% per year. We retain what we, what we get. 
We provide an environment that they like to be in. <coughs> Strong supervision, realistic training, no, uh, no harassment, no games. It's all business. What's the future of the fire and rescue service? Well, the plan is uh, July 1st of 2019, fire and rescue system is going to convince the board of employ on a 56 hour work week out of 48, 24 hour shifts. A new place for the volunteers. The cost is in the tens of millions of dollars. Board of County Supervisors just approved phase one of the pay compression, <coughs> fixing their salaries. Take a ballpark of fixing salaries that haven't been paid appropriately over the last 10 years. From the last recession, everybody's probably going to get bumped. It's good 10%. Then they got to work 10% more times as they go from 48 to 53, roughly. So do the numbers. It's not free. When you replace the volunteers with 24 hour career staffing, you're paying tens of millions of dollars. I don't know who's going to pay for it, but y'all have the money. The county wants it. They just got to come up with a reason to get it. <laughs> Lastly, some data came up that said the county is not reaching its goals on providing paramedics to the scene of a house of a sick and injured person in eight minutes. Anybody know why that is? Not every fire station has a paramedic in it. They're going to spend 10 or 20 million dollars replacing hundreds of volunteers on engines. They're not adding one medic in it. The reason why the medic units aren't making the calls is because the fire engines are having to go run the calls, waiting for the paramedics, then they miss the fire call. So now they can't get to a fire call within four minutes because <clears throat> they're backfilling the medic units. But they're going to let you know what it's going to cost to fix all that and eliminate the volunteer at the same time. I see you. <laughs> so hopefully, over time, we'll increase the number of paramedic units we've got in the county and appropriately staff what the county needs. They're into safety. You want to spend some money? Let's get the right number of police officers on the street. They're only about 60% of the way there. They don't have any volunteers. I'll end it with that. You can read that. So as a taxpayer in the county, there's your wet blanket. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Potomac District, almost uh, uh, Dumfries. Um, I guess this isn't directed to any. This may be uh, directed to any member of the panel uh, who wishes to address it. Um, a few years, and in my private capacity as an attorney, uh, I had occasion to uh, address some issues that arose uh, in Maryland uh, where volunteer firefighters who were also professional firefighters in their day jobs um, would uh, were being threatened with a rule that they weren't uh, an internal union rule um, from the IAFF that they weren't permitted weren't going to be permitted to volunteer uh, the theory I guess being that it took away uh, union jobs um, is that type of activity still going on uh, from the IAFF and uh, if, if not when is, is that is that part of this dynamic here um, that uh, um, public employees unions are attempting to do away with the volunteers because it takes away jobs Thank you. okay uh, so the simple answer to that question is no there is no uh, effort here in Prince William County for the IFF, which I'm the president of the local IFF affiliate, uh, to try to get other members from other locals to stop volunteering in the county. I believe you may have heard Chief McAllister say that 26% of his membership are career firefighters elsewhere. So no, we are not trying to get the 26% of his membership to not volunteer in the county anymore. Thank you. Other questions? Um, is the, where am I going to go? I'll go. I'll go way over. Did you have a question? Yeah, I have. Uh, I have actually two. Questions. I have a little research on the. Uh, no. Harry, the, introduce from, yourself in your district. Sorry, Harry Wiggins, uh, Aquan District, uh, from the uh, Virginia Department of Fire Programs. Uh, it looks like uh, career response times. Uh, are much better uh, in those departments that are career departments versus combined departments. And I note that Fairfax County, the response time uh, median standard is 89%, ours is 41%. Uh, what I'd like to know is how many, how many additional staff would it take to have a fully professional fire department in Prince William County? Does anybody know the number? So no one has ever looked at this. I'm not surprised. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take that, I guess, <laughs> surprisingly. So I'm going to attempt to answer your question based upon what was just presented to the Board of County Supervisors. I'm not going to profess that I have these numbers. I'm going I'm to tell you what was presented to the Board just recently. Uh, and your question really can't be answered without understanding the dynamics. And it, it's a pet peeve of mine when we're compared to any other jurisdiction. It's like we have a saying, two fires are never the same. There's construction differences of the houses, the way the fires start are different, the way that the burn pattern is, and so forth. It's the same thing with two jurisdictions. If you look at us in Fairfax and you look at how close Fairfax's stations are together and the number of stations that they have and the fact that they run multiple EMS units out of a few of their firehouses, then they are making their times because they have more apparatus and more people. Right now, I didn't get to it, I had to shortcut it, but that infrastructure is a huge issue here in the county that we've got to overcome also. The information that was just relayed to the Board of County Supervisors, what it would take 33 career personnel, an additional 33 to the hiring this, this year to replace what the volunteers are currently staffing. And I use the word replace carefully because as has been alluded to, the plan is to keep the combination system and leave the volunteers to staff. It, the first out engines is was reported to the Board of Supervisors and the career staff would staff an extra ladder truck or an extra engine or something that were in the same stations. So it's hard to answer your question because you're not, we're not really comparing apples to apples. I don't know that that vision, that study has been done completely to take it to the seven new stations that we know that we need. We do need that. Um, 
acquiring the property for those stations. There is a lot to it. A lot of that has been looked at. But uh, as far as the infrastructure that has to go in place with those 33 people, those 33 people just get us what we have today, essentially. So I know it's not a good answer to your question, but that's what was presented to the Board of Supervisors just recently. Thank you. My name is Don Scoggins. I'm with the uh, Occoquan Magistral District. <clears throat> I have a question. Um, it appears to me that there's still a schism between the volunteer firefighters and the professional firefighters. And I was wondering how can we have, uh, I would say, better service when you have a schism between, between the two groups, so to speak. And <clears throat> also it seems like when you have I guess the more you build up, the, everyone wants to have a professional fire fighting team, but it seems like uh, the expense of dealing with that, with the bricks and mortars and all the other accoutrements that come with it, we you can't compare Prince William County with Fairfax County. We just don't have the tax base to cover that kind of a major expense. I was just wondering what, you know, have you all really sat down together and just figure out what we need to do? I think. I'm sure the gentleman. I'm sure one of the gentlemen to my left are going to want to jump on that too. Um, and I, my mind is going blank. Or I was about to go with that. Um, we, if you notice my the last slide that I, I did not want to pass up, even though my time was up. The last slide that I put up there is there's three entities that need to be sitting in the room that need to be sitting at the table talking together, and that's the leadership from the Department of Fire and Rescue. It's the leadership from the volunteer side, and it's the leadership or the representatives, whatever he wants to assign from the union. The three entities need to be sitting. Those are the stakeholders that are running this system. They need to be sitting at the table together. They need to be working through the issues. I would just want to add to that um, and to build on the fact that um, while we may, from a pay comparison or um, a work schedule comparison, compare ourselves to another jurisdiction, we need to build a fire and rescue system in Prince William County that works for Prince William County. Um, all you need to do is drive through Tyson's and realize this is not Fairfax County. And it, it probably will not be in my lifetime. Um, I, I think the visual of what you see up here, we've talked about the Department of Fire and Rescue, the volunteer departments, and, and the local sitting at the table. That's who's sitting at the table this evening. So I think that, this, that that's a great visual to go. We are, we are working together and we have the ability to work together collaboratively to move the system forward. Um, for the future. And there's no issue amongst the uh, career and volunteer members in the firehouses or anywhere else. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the volunteer and career members count each other's friends. They do things together, etc. So I don't, I don't want your question about the schism you know, amongst the career and volunteer force paint an, uh, an ugly picture because that's that's not there um, but when when you get up into the executive level of the fire and rescue system the direction that we're going is not advantageous to the taxpayers count uh, Jack UMG and the Occoquan Magisterial District uh, this is addressed to the panel I'd like to start maybe have Steve begin the answer and I was Collaboration and respect is really important. So how do we make sure that with a, a, a combined uh, department, I know the board wants this to be successful. This is really important. So how do the volunteers get the same treatment at the table as the paid firefighters and foster? And how do we foster an atmosphere of mutual respect in the organization of melding everyone together to have that happen in a way so that we have a successful mix in the future. Thank you very much. So for a volunteer to be successful in the fire and rescue system, he has to have a, a meaningful task, right? Um, you can be a volunteer firefighter, EMT, paramedic, truck officer, heavy rescue squad guy, whatever. But what else is there to do if you're not at the volunteer fire department doing your meaningful task? You, you ever see uh, Forrest Gump? How many ways is there to cook a shrimp? <laughs> so you ask a volunteer firefighter, what would you be doing if you weren't at the firehouse? 
thousand things. And I can write down on that list of the thousand things they could be doing, one costs money, or the other you can get in trouble. <laughs> so, when you come to volunteer your fire department, you have a meaningful task. You are ready to go to respond to people's problems that they can't solve on their own. If they're sick or they're injured or they're trapped in a car or a burning house, they have a meaningful task. If you show up at the firehouse at 6 o'clock at night and there's a career crew there and you're trying to figure out, you know, are there enough beds? Is there enough desk space? Enough lockers? Is there actually two fire trucks to ride? Because we don't ride together. And this fire and rescue system is a combination, but there's no combination of crews. They come on, they go off. We come on, they go off. There's no blend. Supposedly, it's a human resources issue on who can supervise who, because we're not employees. This is the only, this is probably the only combination system in the United States that has that line in the sand. You go anywhere else in the United States, combination system, careers and volunteer personnel riding together. Not here. Rip, we have time for, uh, I would say, probably two more questions. Good All right. Maybe three. Uh, excuse me. Uh, Coles District. Uh, I have a question that taxpayers might care about and it would help you build your business case for funding and infrastructure. Have you ever looked at the economic impact of the response times? For example, the 41 percent or other response times or perhaps housing values, uh, things that are really infrastructure driven but uh, that might be of interest to taxpayers like me on how we take a hit for not funding our fire department or EMTs the way we should. I'm not quite sure. I'm not sure I have an answer for that, that it's not been looked at from that perspective. Uh, insurance companies do look at your performance, for example, in establishing a race, so it has a direct impact on what our home insurance costs. Okay. Seems like it'd be an interesting one. So I'm an insurance guy, right? I've been an insurance guy for 20 years. One out of every 1,200 homes in Prince William County is going to burn to the ground every year. That's just the data. You know, there's so many, so many cars are going to be crashed, so many houses are going to burn, all this other stuff. Your rate um, is not going to be significantly impacted unless you have a fire hydrant in your front yard. And in this county, there have been either neighborhoods or service authorities that have elected not to put public water in the street. Um, down Bacon Race Road is a prime example. That's horrible. March of March of last year, I pulled up in front of a house on Ramrod Road at 2:30 in the morning, mm -hmm. and that thing went to the ground. And it was an old house. This was a solid house, but the problem was there's no water in the street. We got to truck it in. Two, it was windy, so that makes a fire go. And three, we can't fix people from throwing cigarette butts mm -hmm. into mulch. We can't fix that. I mean, 50, I can't tell you what the fire data is for this county because it's not released. But last week on the Fairfax County Twitter page, 50% of the fire loss in Fairfax County are mulch fires from cigarette butts. They lost that bank two weeks ago. They lost that senior living facility two weeks ago. Somebody put a cigarette butt in a planter on the third floor. We lost one section of the fourth floor of Hedgewood in 2002 from a cigarette butt in a planter. Um, so we have a mulch problem. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't so pretty and cheap. That's right. You couldn't yeah. put it around the house. <laughs> Chuck E. Cheese, second largest Chuck E. Cheese in the United States. Burned the front down, front off of it. A lady was in, uh, it was a Sunday night about midnight. A lady calls 911 and said, Hey, I just went through the drive through line at McDonald's on the parkway. Is the fire department coming to Chuck E. Cheese? Uh, no, ma'am. Why? Well, it's on fire. <laughs> a cigarette into the mulch, let the stuck go on fire, burn in front of the building on fire. 
And if you want to, if you want to cut down half the fires in Prince William County, you, you write an ordinance that says you can't put mulch within five feet of your of your combustible home. <laughs> they did it in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and it went to court. And Harrisonburg won. So now they got to put rock within five feet of any building. I think it's a public building, not a house. They're not going to tell you to put it around your house. They put it around your apartment building. And we're not going to burn down apartment buildings. All the apartment buildings are in a sprinkler. So. I'm just going to cut you off and go to the next question. But that was interesting about it. I'm, I'm going to go home and get rid of my mulch. Anybody else get rid of that mulch? Um, what the smoke for? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't try to bust in the mulch, Ann. Um, Ann Wheeler um, from the Gainesville District. Just a real quick question. You know, I know that there are changes, you know, are sort of moving across across the county in terms of engine companies changing and, you know, changes are being made. And my question is, how are those actually made? Are they made in a vacuum? Or are they made collaboratively? You know, I know you get data. Who actually makes the decisions on those changes going forward? I, I would say that there's multiple ways to answer that question. Many of those are data-driven. Where are those service needs and service gaps within, within the county? Um, you know, one example that I would give you in this, uh, for the FY19 budget, there was two ladder trucks that were identified to be staffed. The governance model for the system um, right now, uh, that decision is, I think you have already discussed it at the executive committee level as to where those units would be deployed within the county, one east and one west. And that recommendation um, is forwarded to the fire and rescue system chief under the new um, county code for, for a decision. So it is, um, to some degree, a collaborative effort. And that's the way I would see it moving forward in the future outlook for the fire and rescue system. Did you want to hear that? Yeah, I got a question. Yeah. Joan. No. Okay. Do you have the microphone, right? Oh, me. Oh, yes. He's got the next question. Thank you. Are you still going? No. No. All right. Hey, uh, Vic Angry, brand new member tonight. To the All right. So, I'm a member of Dell City volunteer. But I'm, I want to um, just speak as a, com a retired command sergeant major, Vic Angry, 23 years in the Army. Um, and so, my, my comment really is just. No one has really asked me, why do I volunteer, all right? Uh, why do I do this? Why did I waste another year of my life going through recruit school with a bunch of young kids after doing 23 years in the Army, going through all that stuff? I mean, really doing a lot of great things for this country. And why did I take that time to come back and be a volunteer and do what I do? And the answer is simple. It's because I'm a public servant and I love serving my citizens and protecting them. And that's what about 50,000 other Northern Virginia veterans would do if someone ever put together a recruiting program that, that, that really fostered volunteerism. Because truly, volunteering is a community you know, initiative. And it's really something that needs to stand forever. And it's what is the foundation of this country. So I really don't understand like why we're even at this level of this. I understand our job if people want more money. But I, I got to tell you, there's got to be a better way to actually you know, combine this system that we truly have as a combination system. Whereas Chief said, riding together, I mean, I don't have an issue with anybody in the fire department, career, or volunteer. We all get along well. No, I'm sorry. That, well, my question then is, is there an effort to put together a recruiting program for a true volunteer service for volunteers? For military, retirement. military. No. <laughs> agree with you. I think, I think the one thing I would add to that, um, that was also approved um, by the Board of County Supervisors in this year's budget it was a recruitment and retention um, specialist for volunteer members. The, the ideas and concepts that you're throwing forward, I'm sure it would be something that they would be very interested in um, to grow the volunteer system in Prince William County. I, I, let's take just one more question right here. This is it. This is it. <laughs> you know, say about the, this, is the, this is the bomb question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mike Janae, Prince District. 24 fun filled years in the Marine Corps. My question, <laughs> my question is, who runs the fire service and the EMS? Do you run it or do the Board of Supervisors run it? And if you run it, then run it. 
And I think that's the way it should be, but you know, you gotta decide. You guys have gotta to stand together and run it, and they will listen, but they wanna hear what you have to say. That's all I have. I'll, I'll take that one, amen. All right, uh, uh, you've heard what we're dealing with. Again, I, we wouldn't have had this event if there weren't issues, right? And we need to solve these issues for the good of our residents, for the good of our county. So um, we appreciated your input tonight. And uh, thank you uh, for participating in this. I think it's gonna take a lot of courage. It's gonna take a lot of humility. It's gonna take passion and drive. Last night I was in a room with Lou Holtz. If you've ever heard him give a, a speech, it, it just energized me for tonight and the fact that this is possible. What seems impossible is possible if we have the drive and the passion to make it happen. We want a great combination system. So thank you uh, for participating. I'll turn this back over to Ann Taylor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.